Okay, I promise to keep this as, as brief as I can, but I did realize that in the course of the opening lecture, we really didn't get to much of a conversation about William Blake, who's of course the first major author that we are encountering in this course. So I do want to take a little bit of time this morning, or whenever you're watching this, to talk about William Blake. Um, now, right away, um, as you look at the Norton and read the biographical information about Blake, you can kind of get some sense of why it is that I'm not always super enthusiastic about the bibliographies. Um, in the Norton, it makes this claim about his wife <laughs> and about how they probably didn't have a happy marriage because of some poetry that he produced. Um, I think that's a radically unfounded claim. There's certainly no evidence in the text of that. So we want to maybe not take a statement like that too seriously. There is some good basic information about where he grew up and kind of his socioeconomic conditions that I think are relevant and some good conditions, good, good, good comments there about his um, interactions with the law and the potential hanging uh, that he avoids. Uh, but all of that aside, let's think about the actual poetry. And the section that I pointed you to for today um, begins with some of his, his more interesting uh, reasonings, uh, all religions are one, there is no natural religion, those kinds of sections, which are neat in and of themselves because he's kind of parroting, he wouldn't think of it as a parody, but he's kind of, you know, working very much in this this uh, th th this systematic uh, mode that's particular to uh, the Enlightenment, uh, the period in which he's living. So this idea that I'll put down my fundamental principles and then I'll reason towards some conclusion, they're kind of fun to, to play around with and we might come back to them later in the course, but I just want to get uh, across to you very early that Blake is an individual who is, is very intently trying to peer into the heart of things and, and what he sees there is poetic genius, uh, which is a subject he begins to discuss and think about and will be significant to a number of authors that we write this term. But that, that's kind of one set of concerns, which is fascinating and interesting. And we're going to come back to it. But what I really want you to be thinking about when you're going through Blake is I want you to be thinking about the excerpts we have from his songs of innocence and experience. And before I get too far into them, there's, there's something that you should know, which is not included in the Norton because it's generally pretty hard to reproduce. But when Blake produced these documents... Um, the vast majority of his poetry, he, he was also an artist, an engraver. And so the vast majority of these poems come in the context of these really beautiful, very colorful um, etchings. And I would strongly encourage you, or engravings, I may have the wrong artistic term there, and, and excuse me, but I, I, I would encourage you to, to look up Blake's artwork um, and look up the poems online because you can find very, very wonderful representations of these these plates that go along with the original poems. The, the, the most significant one, I think, perhaps for our purposes, uh, well, the sick rose, it would be a good image for you to dig up, as would the tiger. The tiger is quite important because when you read the tiger, you get the image of this very fierce tiger. But when you look at the painting he puts alongside of it, it looks a great deal like Tigger from uh, Winnie the Pooh. Okay, uh, it's kind of this cartoonish, uh, like startled, uh, like almost stuffed animal child toy, and that makes the poem uh, change, well, it affects the poem's meaning, I would say, quite dramatically. So if you find one or two of these little poems and you realize that you like them, I would encourage you to go find the etching, because the etching usually has contextual information that can bring more insight into the poem. But let's just think about a couple of things going on here that relate to my opening lecture. Okay, so when I was talking about the opening lecture, I, I, was, I was kind of bringing out this idea that we have um, some really interesting... Um, artists working at this time who are playing with the relationship between reality and imagination or reality and possible perceptions and it's all occurring at a time of increased national identity, increased regional identity um, as we're moving you know, closer and closer to uh, the 19th century. Uh, th this text kind of comes near the end of the 18th century. Okay, so why is that significant? Well, if you start to read through, let's just take the beginning of um, Songs of Innocence for a few minutes, okay? If you read the introduction, and as you go through that, you'll see the reference to a child on a cloud. And, as, and then as you go to the echoing green, you have this image in memory of these children running in this green space. And then in the lamb, we have this very nice conversation between kind of a childish character and a lamb. And they have this moment of shared faith, or at least the speaker is expressing 
this moment of faith. And then as we get through it, as we push through this section, what you're going to see is that some of these images repeat. They return, they come back, and when they come back, their meaning is significantly altered. Okay, and you're also going to see this when you get into songs of experience um, in some very dramatic ways. Holy Thursday being, I think, probably the best uh, example. But if we if we go through it, and I think maybe a good place to just kind of land for a few moments is on, uh, well, the lamb and um, uh, the chimney sweeper. Maybe we'll talk about the chimney sweeper first. So when you when you read the chimney sweeper, you know you're given what on the one hand appears to be this kind of melodic kind of flowy poem, but as you kind of dig into it, what you realize is that there's something very unnerving going on in the chimney sweeper. And one of the things you may not know, kind of contextually, is that in London and other urban areas, children um, for a long period of time at the direction uh, of uh, the church, uh, the Church of England, were directed to clean chimneys, okay, be, to, to sweep them out. Um, a very dangerous, uh, high mortality rate profession, uh, where if you didn't die literally stuck in a chimney, uh, you were very likely to die from the soot that you would ingest uh, undertaking that task. Task So very, very young children, precisely because they're very small, are used to clean the chimneys in a range of um, homes and institutions and other, other such places. By today's standards, it's, it's a horrific practice. And certainly by the standards of the time, it's also clearly horrific or else Blake wouldn't be picking up on it as well. He clearly sees what's going on, right? Um, second stanza, there's little Tom Dice who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back, so we have the lamb being referenced again, right, was shaved. So I said, hush, Tom, never mind it, for when your head's bare, you know that the soot cannot spoil your white hair. It's a really tragic image, right? You have one child talking to another. Um, it's okay that your head is shaved because the soot's going to spoil your hair. Well, it's very sad because the child is being stuffed into a chimney, right, uh, in order to clean out all of the soot and garbage that goes up in the chimney. And as we have the dream um, that's referenced in the third stanza of essentially all of the chimney sweepers who have died before, okay, uh, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack, uh, were all of them locked up in coffins of black. What's going on here? Well, Blake is taking these very kind of prosaic, very pastoral images, green images, images of uh, rural farm life, um, Lamb, most prominently, this idea of gazing into the clouds and kind of relaxing. And what slowly happens over the course of this set of poems is that these images become more and more associated with urban life in London or in related areas. And we have broader social commentary as well. You'll see this in The Little Black Boy, where there's references to hair that connect to several other poems as well. Um, for me... I think the one poem that, that makes a lot of this come together is London, okay, which is a very dark poem, uh, but you're going to see it on page 132, uh, where we have the speaker who tells us, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every child of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. Now, this concept of the mind-forged manacles is, I think, going to be kind of haunting for us at the moment. And there's more to the poem. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most, though midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So what, what's going on in this poem? Well, one of the things you might notice is that we have a vast uh, spectrum of characters and personalities represented in London, very miserable, but interconnected. And the question is, well, what interconnects them? And we have that wonderful phase, the mind forward the mind forged manacles. Uh, what are those? Are they the ways of thinking that unite us? 
Are these ways of thinking that unite us particularly productive, helpful, helpful to the people within a given society, within a given culture? And as you go back through, and if you were to reflect back on what you've read in Songs of Experience, uh, Innocence, excuse me, one of the things you might start to ask is, you know, what is it about these people's lives that's making them, you know, positive and fulfilling or something other? Okay, I would have you take that idea, if you want to play with it a little bit more, and I'd have you go back to all religions are one and there is no natural religion and there is no natural. Uh, and then the other one on page uh, 117, where he starts to kind of lay out this notion about the relationship between something like poetic genius, something like a fundamental act of creation and the ways in which it is people experience their lives. Um, how they're directed to experience their lives in certain ways and how significant those directions are because they can lead people to states of bliss or states of misery. So that's an effort on my part to kind of describe how some of these very early poems might be organized and aligned with one another. If none of that makes sense to you, I would simply say notice how much time he, he spends talking about children. Those of you who had British Literature 1 with me last term will recognize that there was virtually no conversation, uh, or there were very few conversations about children in that part of the course. But when we get to William Blake, we suddenly have this real intense view of children, of childhood, of what it means to grow up in a certain place and in a certain time, and how these things are related to what it is people go on to do with their lives and become later in life. This is a very interesting new way for us to be encountering poetry, um, certainly in the broader context of English literature, this attention to children and how it is children are treated in society and how it is children see the world and how it is children can't yet see the world uh, because they maybe haven't had enough experience yet, and that gets us into Songs of Experience, which I'm not going to talk about too much right now, because I want you to really attend to that um, as you are reflecting on the writing for this week, but use what I've just described about the first half of this reading to help guide you through that portion of the text as well. And again, I would have you think about the significance of repeated images, I'd have you think about the significance of who's being represented, and how it is they are being represented, because these are central concerns. Uh, with regards to William Blake. And if we were to put one giant word over William Blake's head for this course, I would probably put the word perception over his head. Maybe perception with a question mark after it. But that should be enough to at least get you started down the path um, in this course.